Hello, I am your host, Tracy Atsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 257 of ADHD for Smart Ass Women. I hope you'll subscribe to this podcast and our newsletter over at ADHDforsmartwomen.com. My purpose is always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it in the thousands of ADHD women that I've had the privilege of meeting. I've never met a one that wasn't truly brilliant at something, not one. And so for all of these reasons and more, I am just delighted to introduce you to Dr. Kathleen Nadeau today. Dr. Kathleen Nadeau, PhD, has been a thought leader in the field of ADHD for many decades. The founder and director of the Chesapeake Center, one of the largest private ADHD specialty clinics in the U.S., she is the author and co-author or co-author of 15 books related to ADHD and the recipient of the Chad Hall of Fame Award for her groundbreaking work on girls and women with ADHD. Currently, she devotes her time to building the Chesapeake Advanced ADHD Training Institute, otherwise known as Chatty, what a great name, to address the or acronym, to address the significant need for training mental health professionals um, in the diagnosis and treatment of complex ADHD. Dr. Nadeau is the author of Still Distracted After All These Years, the only book focusing on the needs of older adults with ADHD. She is an active advocate for more gender-sensitive diagnostic criteria for girls and women with ADHD that will address the continuing underdiagnoses of girls and women. Dr. Kathleen Nadeau is a frequent lecturer both nationally and internationally. Kathleen, welcome. Did I get all of that right? Oh my goodness, yes. Thank you very much. Well, there's a lot. You have done so much. I just want to make sure that our listeners know who is gracing us with her presence today. Dr. Nadeau is a pioneering force for women and girls with ADHD, and she's been fighting our fight for literally decades. And the fact that we're finally really talking about ADHD and girls and women can be traced back to her groundbreaking and influential work. So I just want you to know how honored I am to have you on this podcast. Well, thank you so much. And I am so delighted that you've invited me on your podcast. I mean, this is my mission in life. I am the mother of a woman with ADHD, the grandmother of two girls, the sister of a woman with ADHD. Um, I have lived this experience, not just worked as a professional. So the more yeah. I can get the word out, the better. Well, you're doing that. And unfortunately for you, it doesn't matter what your level of influence or brilliance is. We all have to start at the same place on this podcast. And that is about your ADHD diagnosis. So could you share that with us? Well, let me start with a funny story about my ADHD. And that is, you mentioned that um, I shared the Chad Hall of Fame Award with my friend and co-author, Pat Quinn, uh, for our work on women and girls. And this was taking place back in the late 90s. So, of course, we're at the annual Chad convention and there's a you know big to do and we're called up to receive our award and thank you. And in typical ADHD fashion, I had written out my remarks and then completely lost them or forgot them and got up there and started my remarks by saying, and guess what? I forgot to bring my notes with me, which of course got a great laugh from the cloud. And um, so I, I think my message to everybody with ADHD is that you know, as you read all the things I've accomplished in my professional career. And yet I think it's so important for people to realize I still have ADHD and glitches still happen in my life. And it's just so important to not get down on ourselves mm -hmm. about those glitches yeah. and to really understand and celebrate the things we're good at. So you were asking me, when was I first diagnosed with ADHD? And the answer to that is I self-diagnosed with ADHD. Mm -hmm. And that was after I had been working in the field for, for quite a while. And oddly enough, I'm, I'm an accidental ADHD 
um, expert, if you will. And the reason I say that is I had been in a general private practice, just very much enjoying being, <clears throat> excuse me, a psychotherapist uh, for people with a whole range of issues. And suddenly the public law changed, requiring that schools provide accommodations and supports to children diagnosed with ADHD. And before that time, a lot of parents wanted to avoid the diagnosis. They were worried that the only purpose of a diagnosis is to put my child on Ritalin. That's pretty much all there was in those days. And I don't want to put my child on Ritalin, so why get the diagnosis? Then this wonderful law comes into effect and my phone starts ringing off the hook from pediatricians saying, do you know how to diagnose this? Because we don't. I mean, it was really, really early days. And so my practice was flooded with referrals for ADHD. Um, I had a partner in this general practice that had interest and background in neurodiversity. And we sort of started a subclinic based on those demands. But the reason all these many, many years later, I'm still in the field of ADHD and loving it has to do with understanding the relevance it had to my family. I mean, my daughter was diagnosed with ADHD when she was four years old wow. by a pediatrician, which is very unusual in those days. Yeah, and especially it was for a girl. Because she was on the hyperactive end uh -huh. and she was fidgety and her little tiny four-year-old legs were covered with bumps and bruises because she was always racing around and running into the corner of the coffee table or bumping into a tree branch if she was climbing in the backyard. And he just, I, I hadn't asked him, he said, your daughter has ADHD at age And so four. you're the clinical psychologist and you had never considered this fact. Well, this was, if you think about the timing, um, this was in very early days when we still believed it was a male disorder. Yeah. And I had a brother who had ADHD and dyslexia. He was your classic class clown. I hate school. I can't pay attention. I'm going to cause a ruckus in the back of the room. Uh, and very bright guy who became a businessman when he grew up, but he stopped at high school. He hated school. And that was my image of ADHD, and it was everyone's image of ADHD mm -hmm. pretty much at that time. And it was only because my little daughter was manifesting the fidgety and also klutzy, we don't write about that much, but a lot of kids with ADHD are very klutzy and they bump into things as they're racing through the room. So yes, I had not considered it because she was bright. She was learning to read very early. You know, all, so I had all of the same misconceptions that, that everybody did. Yeah. So back to my own diagnosis, I started off with this flood of referrals and working with a lot of families around concerns for their kids. And most of the kids that came marching in the door were boys, surprise, surprise, because this was in the 1970s. So as I worked with more and more families, uh, and that rapidly became my specialty just because of the huge demand for services after this public law was passed, it became really clear to me that the parents were saying, I was just like that as a kid, but nobody diagnosed me with anything. And it's, it became so evident that you don't outgrow it. And yet, during those years, we called adult ADHD residual type, as if it's a childhood disorder, but a few adults have residual ADHD. Mm. That's what we believed. Uh, at that time, the training in diagnosing ADHD among physicians was so poor that perhaps they received an hour or two out of all the years of their training, as if it's a very simple thing. It's hyperactivity and impulsivity, and you give them a pill, and that's all you need to know. Um, Is so that we, much different today, though? 
I mean, what I keep hearing is it's about an hour or two as well. Is it getting better? An hour or two, meaning the diagnostic process? Oh, no, no. Um, as far as the training that um, that physicians get. It is not much better. And no. that's a great segue into why I'm starting CHADI, the Chesapeake Advanced ADHD Training Institute. Yes. Now, yes. I'm not going to be training physicians because only physicians train fellow physicians. Right. And so I may develop a medical track and have some of our wonderful psychiatrists be the faculty on that medical track. But for now, um, I am going to be training psychologists, psychotherapists, mm -hmm. coaches, everyone but physicians. But I can tell you that my training as a psychologist, and I was trained in the 1960s, was incredibly poor. Mm -hmm. And again, we just had this, you know, we called it hyperkinesis. I mean, the only thing we were focused on was hyperactivity. And then later, the main thing we focused on was attention. And that may sound like an improvement, but not really, because now I will hear, I was talking to a parent the other day saying that somebody, said they thought my son had ADHD, but I know he doesn't because he can really pay attention when he wants to. Yeah. And just yeah. that completely, complete misperception right. that it means short attention span and that if you can pay attention to anything, then you can't have it. So boy, do we have a lot of work to do. So back to my realization that I had ADHD, the more I saw that the parents didn't outgrow it, the more I thought about my family history, mm. the more I realized that I had a very different version of ADHD than my brother. Um, I was great in school. I loved school. I had a PhD by the time I was in my early 20s. And people say, how could she possibly have ADHD? And yet I can tell you, looking back, story after story of completely spacing out. In my freshman year in college, I went to school just outside of Atlanta. I was dropped off at the Atlanta airport by my roommate. I was going to fly home for spring break. And I thought, oh, I'll buy my mother a little gift for Easter. And I started wandering around the gift shops in the airport, missed my plane completely missed my plane uh, and had to spend the night in the airport because it was the last flight out of the day. So there were plenty of signs early on that I and everybody else missed. So can I ask you, what was Kathleen as a, what was she like as a child? Oh, Kathleen as a child was, again, not somebody that anyone, even looking back now, would think had ADHD. I was helpful. I was energetic. I was my mother's little helper. I was the oldest girl in the family. And back in those days, oldest girls did lots of chores. They did. I mean, I can remember learning to fold, you know, wash towels and things like that when I was three or four years old. I was, you know, uh, mommy's helper in training. And I love to read and Looking back, what I will say is clear signs of ADHD is I would sit in the living room. I was one of four kids running around the house like wild Indians. I'm in my book like this. And people would call me and I wouldn't hear them because I'm in my book to the point that my grandmother said, you've got to get that girl's hearing tested. She There's a big problem there with hearing. And my mother very wisely said, I don't think so, but I'll, I'll be happy to get her hearing tested, you know, so that hyper focus that we also don't talk nearly enough about was hugely an issue for me. I would dive into things and time didn't exist. The rest of the world didn't exist until I pulled myself back out. So were you predominantly inattentive or are you predominantly inattentive or are you combined type? Was there a hyperactivity. Well. I am definitely combined type. I uh -huh. mean, I'm in my late seventies now and I am still a bundle of energy. Yeah. Um, you know, they all, you read all these articles about don't sit all day. You need to stand up 
once every half an hour. I couldn't sit all day if somebody paid me. <laughs> I mean, I have to get up and wander around. You know, and in fact, that's the way I get my chores done. I need to get up. I'm sick of sitting in front of my computer. I'll go finish the breakfast issues. I'll go vacuum the rug. You know, I so I'm back and forth all day. So it's productive hyperactivity, but it is definitely hyperactivity. Well, I guess that's the perfect segue into why you would write, um, still distracted after all these years, which um, I have to say, um, this is such fantastic book. I think that the chapter on medication and the finding affordable treatment resource at the end is easily worth the cost of this book. This is the best description of, you know, it's, it's not really, okay, take, you know, this medication does this, this medication does that. It's not that it's, it's so understandable. It's so clear. It's so concise. It's so simple. Um, yet, there are so many things that you mention in this book that, I mean, I just wrote a book on ADHD and I didn't know. So I, I cannot rave enough about this book. Um, so I wanted to know, why did you decide to write this book now? And I know it came out last year, right? 2022. But why, yes. why now in this time frame? Is it because yeah. of the fact that you are such a bundle of energy <laughs> and you wanted to get the word out that, you know, just this the way society works where, you know, you turn 65 and you go off into the sunset. And what I know about ADHD women, most ADHD women, is that um, we just have this idea of retire. Why would I retire? There's so much to do. Exactly. Well, I'll tell you, it's the reason I wrote the book. I've been wanting to write that book for more than a dozen years. And 12, 15 years ago, I could not interest a publisher in that topic because they didn't think there was a market for it. And now, because of population demographics, yeah. uh, our listeners may not know this, but 10,000 Americans turn 65 every day. Every day. I mean, I'm the oldest year of the baby boomer generation. So, this giant cohort is entering into older years. And so I finally found a publisher going, hmm, maybe there is a market and this is the first and only book. So maybe it'll sell a ton of copies. And that's why. Are you the one who said in this book that um, within the next 15 years, there are going to be more people 65 and over than 18, 18 and younger? Years. Was that in this uh, book? Uh, yeah. That I was a fascinating indeed. statistic. Isn't and so literally, it is in the process of becoming an adult disorder that begins in childhood rather than a childhood disorder that sometimes extends into adulthood just because of our demographics. And yeah. so, it's so important for us to realize that. And the other reason that I wrote it is I think it has helped me enormously in my later years, and I turned 65. A dozen years ago. I mean, I've been an older person for quite a while. So many people think, well, if I've lived this long without being diagnosed with ADHD, why bother now? What, what difference can it possibly make? And there are lots of reasons why it's so important as an older adult and more research is coming out all the time. One of the things I really want to emphasize is Russell Barkley, uh, whom I admire enormously. He has retired recently, but he was one of the preeminent ADHD researchers. And he came into a conference a number of years ago and sort of blew the walls off in making this announcement to all of the professional attendees that his demographic research showed that on average, people with ADHD live a life that is shorter by clear almost a decade. I mean, that's a huge difference. I mean, it was just shocking. And then he wrote about why he thinks that is the case. And a lot of it is that untreated ADHD especially in males, especially in teens and 20s, 
um, leads to all kinds of impulsive and dangerous things and automobile accidents Mm -hmm. and doing some crazy athletic stunts and accidentally killing yourself in the process. Um, It can lead to drug taking and we, you know, we have this whole fentanyl crisis, but people with ADHD, untreated ADHD, I want to keep emphasizing, are much more prone to experimenting with drugs because it's exciting, because they're impulsive. Also self-medicating with street drugs because they don't have the knowledge or income to go get a proper diagnosis. So early deaths happen through drugs, through accidents. Women, right? Women and suicide. Women and suicide. And and I think suicide is more an issue for women than Mm -hmm. an accidental death is more an issue for men. men. Um, But what happens, that's, that's just the beginning. And Russ Barkley wrote about this and he wrote about it in a somewhat judgmental fashion that people just don't have the the self-discipline to lead healthy lives. But what he was really outlining is that the lives that those of us with ADHD tend to lead, we often eat in a very unhealthy way that's very related to our ADHD. We're more likely to live on snack food, junk food, fast food, carry out, because it's a lot of trouble and it requires a lot of planning and organization to cook healthy meals. And so, you know, when you think about the cost of having ADHD, that's a huge cost, that it's much harder for us with ADHD to eat healthy nutrition. Number two, um, it's a well-known fact that we have sleep problems. And when you look at all the things that curtail longevity, it's lack of exercise, which takes a lot of Mm self-discipline, poor nutrition, poor sleep, high stress. It is almost by definition stressful to be an adult with ADHD. So we really have to do a lot of work to reduce our stress and manage our stress. So if you look at the list of things that often leads to an earlier death, we live with those every day and we're not paying enough attention to that. And when I try to talk to clients that I work with, they sort of have a, yeah, 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 everybody knows you need to exercise, you need better sleep, you need, I mean, it's like, it doesn't impact them Mm -hmm. in the way it needs to, that you're really electing to die in your 60s for the most part, uh, if you don't change your living habits. And I'm not telling people, therefore, go out and be healthy. I mean, it's not easy for anyone to do that. And it's much harder for us with ADHD. And so I think we really need to pay attention to that as an ADHD community. How can we provide the structure and support and can there be healthy living groups that adults with ADHD can join where they can support each other in daily exercise and how do I get myself to bed and turn the light out before, you know, oh, dark 30 in the morning? And how can I be realistic about what I'm capable of and still eat a healthy diet? And people without ADHD hire coaches and trainers and go to nutrition classes. It's not like it's easy peasy for anyone to do it, but we need a lot of extra support. And so there's something really interesting when we think about older adults with ADHD and researchers have looked at the statistics and when it gets to older adults, only about 4% of them seem to qualify for the diagnosis when it's higher, younger. And guess what? That's because the other half of us are already dead. Gone. (laughs) They're they're gone. And nobody's made that connection. It's not Mm -hmm. that la, 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 ADHD gets better as you get older. It doesn't. It's just that 
half of the cohort. Well, yeah, it doesn't get better if you don't do anything about it, right? If you don't treat it. And what can we do to treat it in such a way that we're actually receptive to it, right? That it's fun, that it's there's community involved. All of the things that you talk about in this book so well. You've got it. And so one of the things we're learning um, fairly recently, when, when I first started doing research on ADHD and older adults, the research said that there was no connection between ADHD and dementia. Current research doesn't say that at all. I, yes. So uh, I wanted you to talk about that because I was going, la, 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 right? Oh, there's no connection. And then all of a sudden we had that s- big study. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I can. And that's because... <laughs> sure you we're, can. <laughs> we're learning a lot more about dementia and we're learning that dementia in many ways is a lifestyle disease and physicians are starting to refer to Alzheimer's as type three diabetes. I mean, we know that type two diabetes is lifestyle induced right? and they're calling dementia life um, type three diabetes as in if we keep eating that way, we are much more likely to develop Mm. dementia. And in the past, we didn't know that. Yeah. We really thought it was genetic, and, and to a certain extent, it is genetic. Uh, we thought it had to do with the accumulation of beta amyloid plaque, and what does that have to do with diet and lifestyle? Nothing. Mm-hmm. Now we know it. there's an inflammatory right. process, yeah. and so we're much more... It's not that ADHD causes dementia directly. It's just that the lifestyle choices commonly made by people with ADHD then lead to dementia. Ah. Another really important study was just released. It's not a surprising one, but that we all know that older adults are diminished in their capacity to drive safely and that an awful lot of people ought to turn in their licenses well before they do. But a recent study that was just published a couple of weeks ago uh, documented that older adults with ADHD have a much higher rate of accidents. Yeah. Now, that's not surprising. No. <laughs> and and all my, my bet is that most of those older adults are not on stimulant medication. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, most of those older adults probably don't even know they have ADHD. Right. So, so there are all kinds of really important reasons uh, that have come to light even after I wrote the book. Mm. I mean, I knew it was important, but I'm almost feeling like, gee, I need to revise the book in another year because suddenly so, people are paying attention to what happens to older adults with ADHD. Yeah. yeah. I still, though... I, what I love about this book is that I think what you said is that um, we're no longer viewing aging as a decline, but rather as um, continuous growth, right? Meaningful work, structure. And so I know what we're talking about sounds kind of morbid and depressing, but this book is not. It's it's very empowering, actually. Thank um, you so much. And I, you know, I one of the catchphrases I use with so many older adults, uh, I talk about addition and subtraction. Yes. That life is going to subtract things from us. Mm-hmm. I mean, we uh, lose our physical agility to a certain extent. We lose friends because they become ill, pass away, move away. Um, so there is a very predictable series of losses that can lead to depression, isolation, having a very small life, but it doesn't have to be that way. And that's where the addition comes in and really trying to help people consciously think of, I need to make new friends. Uh, My husband and I have joked for years, we need to make younger friends. Our friends are all getting old. (laughs) Well, and there have been studies about that, right? Where if you have friends of all ages, that is the most healthy for, for your brain and That's happiness right. and all of that. 
That's right. Well, I was so delighted. You may have seen this, um, but um, somebody just forwarded me the article two days ago that, do you remember Dr. Ruth, who was so wonderful? Yes. She was fabulous. Yeah. This tiny little woman educating the youth of America, sex she education. She talked about sex a lot. That's what so, I remember. That's what she did. And very straightforward. Very matter of fact and straightforward. Dr. Ruth. Well, I hadn't given Dr. Ruth a thought in I can't tell you how many years. And suddenly there's an article two days ago in the New York Times. Dr. Ruth is still alive and well. She is 97 years old. Oh, I didn't even know she was still alive. She lives in New York City where she's lived her whole adult life. Uh She's been a widow for 27 years. And... Dr. Ruth had a really tough time during the pandemic, as so many people that lived alone did, because her social life, as she you know, was quoted in this article, was going out to dinner every night. There were little restaurants near her apartment, and she would meet friends there, and she knew the staff, and that was her social life. And then she'd take part of it home, and that would be her lunch the next day. And so she had a very lively life. And then the pandemic came in. She couldn't go out to eat, and she couldn't have anybody in because, my gosh, she's in her mid-90s, yeah. and she can't take that risk. So she started focusing on the issue of loneliness during the pandemic. She really struggled with loneliness. And so... And you never expect someone like Dr. Ruth to be struggling with loneliness, right? Yes, right. Well, age, subtraction, mm-hmm. boy, did the pandemic subtract everything. Everyone, yeah. So she gets this idea. I wonder if she has ADHD, by the way. It yeah. wouldn't surprise me. yeah. It wouldn't surprise me. She gets this idea. We have an epidemic of loneliness in this country. And it's, I think, more severe for older adults for because of all the subtractions that take place in life. So she talks to her daughter and some friends of hers in high places that I want to become the New York State ambassador for loneliness. And I'm going to teach people how to combat loneliness. And so, so so-and-so contacted so-and-so. It got to the governor and the governor has appointed her the New York State Ambassador for Loneliness. And this happened a few days ago. And I'm sure- And guess what? She figured out her own loneliness in the process, right? You got it. You got it. And talking about addition and not just subtraction, she's talking- She's uh, multiplying. uh, She's multiplying. Uh, That's a great way to put it. How important it is to do meaningful things in your life, no matter your age, Um, And that retirement, I mean, you may decide to stop doing something that you never particularly enjoyed doing in the first place, but you need to keep engaged. You need to do meaningful and engaging things. So I think she's going to be wonderful for, you know, the community and especially for older adults. She is so spunky. And I don't... 97. 97. Thinking, okay, well, I'm struggling with this. Other people must as well. So I'm going to go out there and help them and help myself too. That's right. I, I got a new project. You're right. There must be. ADHD. But I love it that because she thinks big, it wasn't that she was going to start doing a podcast on loneliness. No, yeah. I'm going to be the state ambassador. For yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so This is a podcast for women, ADHD for smart-ass women, and I'm wondering, are there some unique challenges faced by older women when it comes to ADHD that maybe are not shared with men? Yes, I think there are many, and um, I am working on a new book because- um, Of course you are. Of course I am. A friend of mine jokes, uh, help me before I write again. (laughs) But Pat Quinn and I wrote our book on women. We wrote Understanding Girls with ADHD yes, and Understanding Women. Right. Well, we have revised and probably need to do again the girls, but we never have revised our women's book. Ah. So we are writing a book about and for women with ADHD. And this time we have a third 
co-author who is male and he is a psychiatrist on top of that. Um, so I am thrilled that we suddenly have a male advocate on board from the medical community about mm -hmm. it. And he really has told me he works with me at my clinic. He is a trainer of psychiatry residents at Georgetown University. Wonderful. And his professional mission is to raise awareness of how to diagnose and treat women with ADHD. Mm. So we are just starting to work on that. And I think when you asked me, are there particular issues for older women, there are particular issues for females, starting from when we're very, very young. And I mean, duh, girls are different from boys. Of course they are. And they're, we're different in lots of ways. And social interaction between girls is very different from boys from a very early age. Boys and men, for that matter, sort of engage in parallel play. I mean, going golfing with somebody all day, as far as I'm concerned, is parallel play. Yeah. Women would say, why do we need to stand out in the golf course? Let's just sit down and talk. You know? But girls start interacting and we flourish and function best in interaction with other women. But we females with ADHD, because we're different in a whole number of ways, and it's not as we're not cookie cutter alike. In fact, I am writing about it in the new book that ADHD in women is a coat of many colors. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so much of the work that's been written about women with ADHD is if we're all alike, that we're all white and married and mothers and live in the suburbs and mm -hmm. write about our struggles from that perspective. And we are far from that. And I've been interviewing women from all walks of life in a section called In Their Own Voices that will be in the new book. Um, you know, I super bright women, women physicians, women entrepreneurs, black women, women that are struggling as single parents, women, you know, there are just so many different circumstances yeah. that we find ourselves in. But I think throughout our lives, one of the core issues has to do with social interaction. We so crave feeling connected and accepted and it's so hard for many, many women with ADHD. Um, Stephen Hinshaw, of whom I have the greatest respect, did this marvelous long, long-term research project at UC Berkeley in which he created a summer camp so that girls with ADHD could be observed in interaction with non-ADHD girls mm -hmm. every summer for years. Mm -hmm. And... To put it in a nutshell, he said that combined type girls are more likely to be socially rejected, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that the, the non-ADHD girls find them, you're too loud, you're, you interrupt, you're bossy, you're, you know, just, and inattentive girls, as Stephen Hinshaw wrote, are socially neglected, not actively rejected. It's just they're a quiet little girl and they don't yeah. quite know how to join the conversation and they don't have much confidence. So we struggle with these issues. And that's, I really want to keep emphasizing that there are plenty of women with ADHD with strong social skills. I yeah. mean, it's not, it's not in any way a universal, but it's very, very common. And I think that what we need to talk more about is I think one of the most healing things we can do for little girls, big girls, women, is to treat them in groups with one another. Yes. Community. Yeah. You talk about that. Community. And Finally, there are a whole group of women that accept me and get me and we're laughing together and we're talking about our struggles without feeling apologetic or defensive. We had a girls group at my clinic and the group was total chaos. These were combined type girls. 
total chaos. Um, the woman who ran the group couldn't even keep them in the room. And they were racing up and down the corridor. They were going out in the reception area and getting snacks from mom because they didn't like the snacks we were serving. I mean, they, they were <laughs> up and down and sideways. And I talked to the psychologist that was running the group and going, mm, do you think we are really helping these girls because they can't even seem to be contained in the room to have a program. Uh -huh. Those girls loved that group and begged for it to continue mm. because it was the first time they'd been with girls just like me and they were having a ball. Yeah. It was so helpful for their self-esteem uh -huh. to be in that group. And I think that's something we really need to pay attention to. At the opposite end of the age continuum, a longtime friend and colleague of mine, a female psychiatrist, emailed me yesterday about a woman with ADHD in her 70s mm. who is in a lot of pain. And it just paints such a picture of, you know, these little girls that don't fit in, and here she is in her 70s. Yeah. She's widowed, yeah. uh, so she sold the house that she'd lived in many years and went into assisted living. She's been diagnosed. She's in treatment. I mean, it's she's not one of these people that didn't get, but she's in much more pain now, psychological pain, and I think I know why. Um, women in assisted living, it's almost like being sent back to college or high school. Oh my. It's almost all females and their groups and cliques and, you know, come I sit at our table that. for lunch and come sit at our table for dinner. And oh, we're going to form our own bridge group over here because, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so this poor woman is telling my friend, her psychiatrist, I'm surrounded by organized, competent women and they're clearly annoyed by me, and I feel so hurt and defensive. Oh. So here she is at the end of her life experiencing the same thing. I don't fit in, and it's really clear that most of the women around me are annoyed by me. Annoyed by me because I interrupt. I'm a little too loud. I arrive late. I forgot it was Tuesday, you know, whatever it is. She needs to start an ADHD group in her assisted living facility. And yet the sad thing is women with ADHD are very, very challenged to initiate. I Organize mean, and, I'm yeah. sure she would attend it if mm -hmm. somebody started it, but yeah. I'm, I'm sure she would. So when you say do females deal with different issues, I think, I think there are two core elements that are huge that affect us throughout our entire lifetime. One is the social issue I just mm -hmm. talked about. And the other is societal, that all this women's lib we've theoretically achieved over these decades. Society, you'll read article after article that I don't care if the woman is a CEO, her husband still expects her to do most Absolutely. of the parenting and child. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that's exactly what we're bad at. Right. And so we don't. And it's BS. It. You know, we don't put this on men with ADHD, right? We assume they'd go get help. We assume that, you know, they would get all the, they'd have all the structure that they need versus with women. We're made to feel guilty if we can't do all of those things. That's right. We're supposed to be helping everybody else. not yeah. Everybody else is social secretary, right? Exactly. And so throughout our lives, um, if we are disheveled, if we haven't gotten our hair done or, you know, didn't get ready in time to look put together, whether we're in high school or college or you name it, if we're a mess, if I interviewed everyone about, do you entertain at home? And I just mm. had to laugh out loud when one of the women responded, not if I can help it. <laughs> <laughs> However, if it's your area of interest, then you're brilliant at it, right? Which is what makes it also it. confusing. 
Well, let me tell, let me, um, cause I'm, I see that we're sort of nearing the end yeah. of our talk and I don't want it to be all negative. I was responding to how does ADHD impact females differently? Mm-hmm. Societal mm-hmm. expectations, social interactions, those are two powerful themes. Hormonal fluctuations, oh yeah. my goodness. And we're just starting to pay attention to that yeah. now, um, that one of the most common times for a girl to be diagnosed with ADHD is when she hits puberty. Yep. Because that's the first time her hormones start fluctuating. Right. Um, I will tell you that I headed a panel on women with ADHD at a conference, I'm not sure, seven years ago, maybe. And I invited several women researchers to join me on the panel. And a not to be named, very, very well-known male ADHD expert invited himself to the panel. Oh. (laughs) Saying, I've done research on girls. I should be invited. So he invites himself. And... In the Q&A period, after we all gave our little talk, you know, it was a panel of us, women started standing up asking about hormones. And I said, absolutely. And I talked about perimenopause and that that whole decade is very challenging and menopause is huge, et cetera, et cetera. And this male researcher said, I need to interrupt. There's absolutely no evidence. There's no research on any interaction between hormones and ADHD. Uh, and I, I did not say this to him, but I would have liked to quote Carl Sagan, who famously said, absence of evidence is not evidence wow. of absence. Right. Uh, and so, so I wonder what he's saying now. I wonder too. So that's a, there's suddenly a lot of interest. Mm-hmm. All being moved forward by females, mind you, around hormones. And and most of them are females with ADHD, which I just love. I do too. I do too. So what are the differences? Social interaction, societal expectations, hormonal fluctuations. Those are the three biggies. Okay. I want to leave you with a wonderful story uh, that is still ongoing. And that is when the pandemic hit, I and the rest of the people at my large clinic thought, what can we do to help people through this God awful time? So we started offering 11 different completely free support groups focused on different things, helping parents that were at home trying to deal with their elementary school kids, uh, helping young adults who were completely isolated. What? And one of the groups that I started with my age mate, the only age mate at the clinic, uh, and I'm we've known each other for years, we started a support group for older adults with ADHD. And that started in early 2020. That group is still going. Oh, that was... It. The other groups kind of fell to the wayside. I mean, people were managing better. There were other you know, resources available to them, and they didn't need to come anymore. That older adults group, uh, and, and mind you, it has, I mean, we advertised for older adults. What we got was, surprise, surprise, older women. Uh, and there were two men that ever joined that group and both of them barely said anything and only stayed a short while. Yeah. Good. Right. So that's good. They can go back to the golf course. That sounds so sexist. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I have to ask you one question that just blew me away. If I can, before you go. Sure. Absolutely. Um, because it's personal. I have a reason for wanting to know this. So you mentioned that while stimulant medications are effective for about 70% of people, 30% may not respond or, you know, we find that the side effects, they're, they're untenable. That would be me. But then you said something about using both methylphenidate and amphetamine. So like, would that be Ritalin and Adderall? And that if you do that, It'll work for another 15%. So all of a sudden, the success rate goes up to 85%. Am I getting that correct? No, I'm, I'm not saying that at all. What I, but what I am saying 
is that I think the great majority of people have a bad reaction to whatever stimulant they were first prescribed, Mm -hmm. or maybe they'll put up with tweaking it. Okay, let's try a different one or let's try a different dose. And then they just give up because either it's not helping at all, or I can't stand feeling so wired. Yeah, it that would be me. me. Yeah, and and that's true for many women because it sort of interacts with anxiety. Yep. And I feel that a lot of psychiatrists are, are most psychiatrists are not trained in the nuances of this to know that SSRIs can be easily prescribed in combination with stimulants, and sometimes that can reduce the anxiety. A lot of psychiatrists don't know. I was talking to a woman about this just a few days ago, that some people are so sensitive to stimulants that what they need is a microdose and they're never given a microdose. Yeah, yeah. that would be me too. Slow metabolizer. There you go. Yeah. I worked with a guy who was six foot two, you know, big, decent sized guy who took 2.5 milligrams of Ritalin. Now, a six-year-old is given 10 milligrams. He took 2.5 and it really helped him. And if he took any more than that, he couldn't stand it. And I think a lot of psychiatrists or prescribers would never even consider that as as an option because they're, they're just not as experienced in the nuances. So no, I'm not saying that if you combine. Well, let me um, read. Let me read what what because I I highlighted and I'm like I need to know more about this. When both MPH and AMP are tried in combination, about 85 percent of people get a robust, life changing level of benefit with very good tolerance of minor side effects. But again, that means that 15 percent of people who try the standard stimulants either do not get benefits or can't tolerate the side effects. Right. And darn few psychiatrists ever consider prescribing that combination. What is that combination, though? That's I've never heard of this there, before. There are two families. There are two right? families of stimulants. Right. Um, one is the methylphenidate family, and the other is the dextroamphetamine family. Yeah. And all psychiatrists or pediatricians, whatever, know, well, if this doesn't work, we'll try one in the other family. But it's an extreme rarity that they say, well, let's try a little bit of both. Well, I've never and, heard of this after all right. these years. So and the why, nuances of that. Why would that work when it doesn't work on its own? And what would be what would the combinations look like? Because, well, methyl, methylphenidate is like a Ritalin, right? That That's a methylphenidate. And... An amphetamine. Adderall, Vyvanse, all of those are methylphenidate. Okay, so would you take a little tiny bit of both of those then? Is that what you're saying? I want want to be clear that I am not a psychopharmacologist. And so I can't be saying, well, if you take two and a half milligrams of this and five milligrams of that. it's individual and, yeah. But what I am saying is there is research that supports that sometimes a combination really? of both in lower doses can be very impactful. And and why is it just? I don't know, because I, that's what I'm saying, that I'm out of my depth in terms of what the mechanisms of action mm-hmm. are. Okay. Okay. But there's research that shows that yeah. this often can work for people. Exactly. Because well, I'm going to run right, right over to my doctor and say, look, this is in her book. Let's try it. And you've got nothing to lose by trying it. Oh, I've tried so many different medications. I just, however, one time, and I talk about this, Ritalin worked for me one time. I was getting ready to give a speech. I can't memorize anything. I took it. Um, I was coming home from, you know, the, the doctor. I had the prescription. I took it. And it was like the sky opened up. And I literally could go through that speech word for word five times before I went home. It never happened again. But wow. that little bit, right, makes me realize that there's something that could work. There's something that will work because it happened one time before. I Absolutely. Just can't figure out the combination. Um, and anyway. brains are so different. Yeah. I mean, some people realize they need to take stimulants intermittently or they become less effective. Um, yeah. yeah. Other people take the same dose for years and it helps them no all the problem. time. 
So before I let you go, what is your number one ADHD workaround? Well, I'm not so sure I would call it a workaround, but I constantly coach myself in my head. Yeah. Constantly coach myself. And I'm talking about little bitty things. Like there's this wonderful phrase, I've forgotten the name of the female coach, but it's her catchphrase of, don't put it down, put it away. (laughs) Don't put it down, put it away. And I will literally say things like that to myself in my head, don't put your coat down on the back of the chair in the breakfast room, put it away. Yeah. That the clutter that we live with is basically a collection of hundreds of tiny incompleted tasks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, that I didn't take this cup and take it to the kitchen and put it in the dishwasher, not on the sink. You know, so so really literally talking to myself yep. out loud about what I know. So that, that kind of self-coaching, and it may sound silly after all these no. years that I need to do that, but I no. find it. It, it. No one's ever suggested that. And I love it. So mine is be a last 5% finisher, right? Because mm-hmm. then it's gone. And every time you walk by it, you're like, oh, look what I did. And there's dopamine, right? It's, there you go. And yeah. I call that tying the bow. Like if you're wrapping a package, the last task is tie the bow. Tie the bow on each thing that you do. And so you'll find me doing things at very odd times of day because I really want to tie that bow I before I go to bed. As many bows as you can. <laughs> That's right. Kathleen, are you working on something that you want to tell us about? I very much want to tell people about the chatty um, Advanced ADHD Training Institute, because there is no profession in which there's adequate training on the diagnosis and treatment yeah. of ADHD. There's just a huge lack. And so most people, if they get any treatment at all, it's purely medication. Mm-hmm. So I think the capstone of my career is sharing all that I've learned over all these decades about how complex ADHD is, uh, how intertwined it is with so many other issues that we really need to have a much broader expertise than most of us have, and that there are really effective ways that we can help people. So if um, people want to know more about this, where would they go? Chatty. Chatty. Well, we are building the website Mm -hmm. as we speak, so they can't find it directly, but they can find information about it on my website for the clinic, which is chesapeakeadd.com. Okay, that's chesapeakeadd.com? Chesapeakeadd.com. So I have a website here um, that's the chesapeakecenter.com. Is that different? It's the same one. Okay. We're, we're, mo- we're moving over to a new website. So the ChesapeakeCenter.com the there. is easier for people to remember probably. Okay. But you'll get to exactly the same website with either one. Okay. So ChesapeakeADD.com or the ChesapeakeCenter.com. Both of them will be on our show notes. Um, Dr. Nadeau, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. It has really been a privilege to meet you. Well, this has been a lot of fun. You're a great interviewer. Yeah, thank you. So Good. that's what I have for you for this week. If you like this episode with Dr. Nadeau, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smartass Women. Thank you so much, and I will see you here next week.